Jesus on Palm Sunday enters into Jerusalem. And both Matthew and St. John make a point of referring us to the prophecy of Zechariah. And in that prophecy, he tells us, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on an ass and on a colt, the foal of an ass. And they bring, and the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. And they brought the ass and the colt and put their garments on them, and he sat thereon. And most of the crowd sped their garments on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The crowds at this point, they are receiving Jesus. And they are receiving him like a king. And the liturgy of Palm Sunday actually puts these words on our lips. The words, swing back doors, higher yet, reach higher immemorial gates to let the king enter in triumph. This Palm Sunday is a reminder for us. It's an opportunity for us to let Jesus Christ enter into our hearts. Jesus Christ has come in order to establish a kingdom, a kingdom of peace, a kingdom of love. And we may ask the question, and St. Josemaria asked the question, how do we acquire that peace? And St. Josemaria's answer, how how do we acquire that peace that on the one hand enables us to love Jesus Christ, And also, how do we acquire that peace that allows the love of Jesus Christ to enter and take its place more firmly in our hearts? And his answer is, this only comes by struggle. We're in a time, of course, where we've all been asked to barricade ourselves into our houses. And we could maybe make a, we could contrast what would be the barricade, barricading in ourselves, barricading ourselves in the citadel of our own selfishness, versus barricading ourselves in a citadel of prayer that leads us to go out to battle, to prepare for battle. That leads us to well, to have a castle that does let the gates down, so that Jesus Christ can answer. That, that, lead, that, that leads us to, well, to all then leave the castle with Jesus Christ, ready to go out and to fight against all misery. And of course, there's many different potential kinds of misery. And the one we want to focus on is, well, what is it that leads us to lose our peace? What is it that leads, what blurs our eyes? What weakens our wills? What numbs the conscience? And one of the things that numbs the conscience, that blurs the eyes, that weakens the will, is that we stop fighting. We give up. We lighten the load. Christianity has always taught that we need to spiritually struggle. This has always been the way St. Jose Maria reminds us. Victory is guaranteed. If we call on the name of Jesus, we know that, for example, just, well, what does Hosanna mean? Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the imperative form, which is how it appears in the Psalms, it's a heartfelt plea for God to come to the rescue. Hosanna very quickly in the early church was incorporated into its liturgy. 
And so we can almost say, well, yes, Lord, even right now, we're called, we're asking you, the, the church is asking you in many ways to come to the rescue. But most importantly, I think for us, <clears throat> we want Jesus Christ, we want the love of God to dwell in our souls. And what does this mean? Well, we know because of original sin, one of the, one of the things that I attribute this to Augustine, this thought, that, well, because of original sin, we all tend to misjudge the circumstances. And also because of original sin, we all tend to have the, a little bit of a disordered emotional response to the circumstances. We don't take delight in the right things in the right way at the right time. We don't fear the right things at the right way in the right time. And if we just take each one of the senses, the five senses, and each one of the faculties of the soul, if we were to slowly meditate on them, we would come to see that, well, each, each sense has some good that it's pursuing. Right? The smell wants to smell. The sight wants to see. The taste wants to taste. But there are also faculties in the soul. There's the imagination. I saw an app the other day training people how to use their imagination. And I don't know. I don't know to what purpose. I just saw it. Well, there's many, there's other faculties of the soul other than the imagination. There's the memory. The medievals were great at memorizing things. They had all these methods to help them to memorize the Bible, to memorize writings of the great philosophers or science or whatever it was. They had incredible, incredibly developed memories or methods for improving the memory. There's the calculating faculty. There is, so there's also the, well, the intellect, and then there's the will. The intellect takes delight in, tr in the truth. The will takes delight in good things. So if we were to take all of these faculties, the imagination, the memory, the intellect, the will, seeing, sight, smell, taste, touch, hearing, <clears throat> we could identify that there are, there are good things that each of these faculties desires. But whenever, whenever concupiscence, whenever we stop fighting and we allow concupiscence to just to desire these things for ourselves, well, then we can start to take the light in them in a way that's inappropriate. At the same time, there's also another step. There's also another possibility. And it's that we come to see that all of these faculties themselves, while they're good and they have proper ends, they also, well, they can be shut down in a way, in a good way. We can say no, even to the good things, that these faculties offer to us. Why? So that we rely on God alone. And this is the difference between Christianity and any other spirituality out there that might lead us to, uh, in a healthy way, make good use of our faculties. That there's a step that we can take. St. John of the Cross took it. St. Teresa of Avila took it. St. Teresa of Lisieux took it. Right? All the great saints, the apostles had it. They were given these gifts. Not to deny the goodness of the faculties, not to the, deny the good things that the faculties pursue, the true, the good, the beautiful, but to say that, well, there is something higher. Reach higher, immemorial gates. Swing back, you doors. Let the king enter in triumph. Every time we sit down to pray, every time we, we seek to live in the presence of God, every time we try to offer up an hour of work for Jesus Christ, we're doing this. We're swinging back the doors of our senses. We're reaching higher, letting the king enter in triumph. And Lord, this is one of the things that we ask. 
We ask that we be committed to this fight. This fight that, yeah, it leads to human joy. But human joy without you, human joy, even, even the best human joy, without the King of Glory, without you who are the King of Glory, is illusory. It's fake. It's barren. <clears throat> with you, with you, all the goods that come, all the, all the good, all the joys, all the human joy that comes, right? It can be transformed into works of charity, works of justice, pardon, mercy, the service of God and souls. I think as soon as we start to outline this, Lord, we realize and we ask for your grace that we, that you give us the, the ardor, that you give us the capacity to make a resolution to do it, right? That if we, if I, if we were to have a discussion about training in a sport or learning how to cook or learning how to keep a house, we would realize that, well, there's, there was ways to do things well and poorly. There's also all sorts of variations. There's also all sorts of very possible ways of training, but training is essential. In order to train well spiritually, we need the right diet. We need the proper therapy. We need the proper nutritional regime. We need the proper rest. We need, to, we need a, a proper trainer to help us know, well, if we're wounded, how to apply, what to do, how to, how to heal the wound. And <clears throat> so if we're going to fight, we need the sacraments. <laughs> and I thank Lord, now more than ever, you've, you're teaching us the great value and the importance of the sacraments. The sacraments, it's the main medicine that the church has to offer. We're realizing more than ever that the sacraments, as St. Josemaria says, are not luxuries. And we never want to voluntarily abandon the sacraments. We're in a time right now where, Lord, in your mysterious ways, which we don't fully understand, many of us don't have direct access to the sacraments. And we're, it's helping us to realize that we want to advance on the road to follow you. We realize that to, well, to breathe in a regular way, we need the sacraments. We realize that for our blood to circulate, we need the sacraments. We realize that to be strong, we need the sacraments. For you, O oh God, are my strength. Our strength comes from the sacraments. Why? Because in the sacraments, we receive Jesus Christ. And in the sacraments, we receive his grace. The sacrament of confession heals our wounds. The Eucharist is what gives us strength. It's the absolute best possible diet, spiritually speaking, to receive our Lord every day in the Eucharist. Perhaps now more than ever, we're realizing that. For you are, O oh God, my strength. Nothing on earth, there's nothing that we can do. <clears throat> there's no experience that we can have that can replace the redeeming blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing on earth, St. Jose Maria tells us, is capable of stemming the impatient gushing forth of the redeeming blood of Christ. Human limitations can veil our eyes so that we do not notice it, so that we do not notice the grandeur of God. Hence, the responsibility of all the faithful, especially those who have the role of governing, of serving the people of God spiritually, of not blocking the sources of grace, of not being ashamed of Christ's cross. Lord, if we could take some of these ideas and contemplate them a little bit more deeply. For you, O oh God, are my strength. The blood of Jesus Christ is gushing forth throughout the world. 
The blood of Jesus Christ, the precious blood of Christ, is there, every drop, <clears throat> ready to redeem anyone who is united to it. And whether we, sec- whether we I think the, the, thing, the point here is that whether we recognize it or not, the blood of Christ is there. It's gushing forth. The problem is that we don't see it. We don't notice the grandeur of God. We don't see its true effects. Lord, give us the grace to see. Give us the light to see. And help us to help us to unblock anything that might be blocking the sources of grace, the sources of your grace on our soul, coming to our soul. And this requires examination of conscience. We said earlier that Well, all of our faculties, because of concupiscence, they can be disordered. We see things in the wrong way. We don't have the light that we need. We love things in a disordered way. For each one, it's going to be a little different. We can we can look at our speech. We can look at we can examine our conscience, and each one maybe could take time on his own to examine this. Whether it's whether it's pleasure, whether it's material comforts, whether it's speech, reputation, honor power of some sort or another, the desire to control, or maybe fear, maybe there are some maybe there are some passions we just we have no control over because we don't try to control them. We've never exercised in that area. Fear. Many people are giving into anxiety and I think in they're not seeing this time as they should, which is an opportunity for growth. But oftentimes these, these difficulties are there because, well, because there's something blocking the sources of grace. I was talking with someone I'm very close to the other day, and he told me about how he bought this piece of property. He bought it's kind of a swampy piece of property. <clears throat> and he noticed, just through various means, he noticed that on this piece of property, it's probably it's, it's like a, probably a piece of property. He'll never develop it, so it's not like. But he wants to see nature there. He wants the animals to enjoy the property and everything. And he noticed that in the middle of the swamp in this piece of property, that there was a certain weed that was growing. And he has good friends who are conservationists, and they were able to tell him that, well, those weeds shouldn't be there. So then he was thinking about things and he thought, well, how can I get rid of those weeds? And again, through talking about things, reasoning things through, he realized that, well, this piece of property, 100 years ago, it had a kind of, a kind of ditch leading into it and a kind of ditch leading out of it. And that if the water is flowing in and out the way it should, the water kind of cleans out whatever leads to those weeds. So now that we're in this time of lockdown, he thought, well, what can I do during the lockdown? And he thought, well, I'm just going to go there every day for an hour or two with my shovel and my electric chainsaw. And I'm just gonna, if there's if there's like 50 years of leaves in the ditch, I'm gonna dig them out and throw them off to the side. Or if there's a tree that's fallen, or I'm gonna cut it. And I'm basically just gonna work for an hour or two a day. It's my exercise. I can have a little fun, get dirty. <clears throat> I'm outside, there's no one around. And it can just be a way of uh, nothing else, getting some exercise. Well, you know, lo and behold, just after even a few weeks, the ditch, the water is flowing through the ditch. It's getting to those weeds, and the weeds have stopped growing. And then, because why? The water is also flowing out. Now, he, it took him several weeks, and he had to dig many yards, hundreds of yards of ditch. But that's a great model. That's a great example for us of the spiritual life. There can be weeds. In this case, well, in his case, it was in his swamp. Now he has a now he has a good swamp. He's drained the swamp, and now he has a good swamp. 
But this is how our this is how our life can be. That there can be fallen trees, there can be leaves that have accumulated over time and turned into muck. There could be dirt that's just accumulated and it's blocking the water. The water's there, but the water is not pure. It's not flowing like it should. It's not cleaning things like it should. The sources of grace are being blocked. And in the case of the church, oftentimes, while we need the sacraments, the digging of the ditch is the sacraments. The digging of the ditch could also be, well, other little things could also be our daily life of prayer. Our capacity to go without things, mortification, self-denial. Living a little program of life. Having a few minutes each day that we dedicate to prayer, to reading the, reading the examination of conscience. I've heard several examples during these days of families that have made the resolution to pray the rosary together. Well, that's definitely Mary through the rosary. That's definitely one thing. And Lord, we thank you for this good example, but that's definitely one thing that helps us to get the leaves out of the ditch. And of course, the sacraments unite us to the cross of Christ. Anyone who is ashamed of the sacraments is ashamed of the cross. We, Lord, we feel this, we who are shepherds, we feel the obligation to commit ourselves to a tenacious effort to remain loyal to your teachings. Those of us who are not shepherds, that's one of the things that we can pray for during these days, that our shepherds maintain a tenacious effort to remain loyal to the teachings of Christ. And how do we do this? Well, we're all involved in this. But of course, the shepherds have an even greater responsibility to acquire a more sensitive conscience, to remain faithful to the dogmas that the church has always taught, to her moral teachings, to the, to the deposit of faith, which is the inheritance of everyone and which everybody deserves. We know the words of Ezekiel. We know the words, the prophetic words of Ezekiel about bad shepherds, son of man, prophecy against the shepherds of Israel and say to them, thus says the Lord, Lo, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should you not feed the sheep? That should lead us, who are shepherds, to be pierced in our hearts. We who have the privilege of feeding ourselves every day on the bread of life, are we not feeding our sheep? You eat the fat of the sheep. You clothe yourselves with wool. But the weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The crippled you have not bound up. The strayed you have not brought back. The lost you have not sought out. And with force and harshness you rule over them. And of course... So often, St. Josemaria speaks about this, that so often people, they're expect, Lord, thank you, because oftentimes many of us know good shepherds. But St. Josemaria also says, so often we meet shepherds that don't, they don't seem to have struggled. They themselves have seemed to have given in to one form, of, one form of slavery or another. Slavery that changed the heart. The slavery of a human outlook the slavery of a desire for political prestige and influence, vanity, money, sensuality. But St. Jose Maria reminds us, well, if we come across shepherds who are like this, we shouldn't be scandalized. We know that there's an abundance of grace, that as we said earlier, the blood of Christ is gushing throughout the entire world. There is an abundance of and generous grace available for us, but all, and also for them, if they do the little that the God asks of them. 
removing the obstacles that get in the way of holiness. Our Lord has strong words for those who have responsibility and fail to live up to it. You have the name of being alive and you are dead. Awake, strengthen what remains of your flock, which is on the point of death. For I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep that and repent. On the one hand, these are harsh words or these are strong words. But on the other hand, they remind us that even in the first centuries of the church, there was a temptation among the shepherds to weaken in their sense of responsibility. And what this means is that in no time, in no place, is anyone safe if he doesn't struggle? Everyone needs the humility of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who came to Jerusalem on a cult. The fathers of the church say, well, the fact that there's a cult and a foal there helps us to realize that well, all Jews, all Gentiles are called to enter the new Jerusalem, the church. We're all called with humility to leave behind any pride that would separate us from Jesus Christ, to accept his help, to accept advice. We're all called with humility to mortify ourselves, to engage in acts of self-denial. Why? Because these temper the heart. These temper the heart. They temper the sentence, the senses, and they allow, as we said early on, they allow the king of glory to enter into our hearts. This is a wonderful time for studying. We should all be studying the wonderful, sublime, beautiful, always abiding doctrine of the church. I know someone who did this in the last couple of weeks, well, just by grabbing a penny catechism. You can get them easily. Their PDFs of them are on the internet. There was this penny catechism. We used to hand it out in the 1980s, but this person got a hold of a penny catechism and he reviewed it himself. It's 80 pages. It's easy to go, quick to go through, easy to go through. Not only is it 80 pages, it's it's 80 like three by five pages. But it's, it's, it's 100 or so questions and it's the absolute most important questions about the faith and what it teaches and how to live it. Well, I know someone who during this time has took the penny catechism and gave three or four classes to, his, to the members of his family. And it led all of them to make resolutions, to get baptized, to be confirmed, to start praying again, to return to the sacraments once again when it's possible. Let's go. Let's go with insistent. Let's insistently go to the Holy Trinity. Let's ask the Holy Trinity to have compassion on everyone during this time, beginning with ourselves. Let's ask his mother, Jesus' mother, Mary, who is our mother, well, to help us to let the King of glory enter into our hearts, that we can live based on the strength of our Lord that we can become vessels of peace instead of being vessels of wrath who bring the love of Christ, who bring the kingdom of Christ to many souls. Mary, Mother of the Church, pray for us.